Hi everybody, welcome along again. Here we are for the Attenborough reading part 13. As you can see, we're on to chapter 5 now and it's Spirits in the Night, which sounds like an intriguing title, doesn't it? So let's get going then. The rain continued intermittently for the next three days of our stay in <laughs> Wailamipu. Although there were short periods of watery sunshine, serious photography was impossible, and we spent our time talking with Clarence, swinging, swimming excuse me, in the tepid river and watching the everyday life of the people. This was pleasant enough, but we were constantly nagged by the thought that precious time was passing and that there were still many interesting aspects of village life which we had not yet filmed. On the seventh day of our stay, we packed up our gear in preparation for the return of the canoe. Clarence was helping us spread ground sheets over our pile of equipment to shield it from the rain dripping through the roof, when he straightened up and said conversationally, Kenneth arrives in half an hour. His confident statement mystified me, and I asked him how he could be so sure. I hear engine, he said, amazed that I should have asked. I put my head out of the hut door and listened. I could hear nothing but the swish of the rain on the forest. Fifteen minutes later, both Charles and I decided we could just distinguish the faint noise of an outboard motor, and in half an hour exactly as Clarence had predicted, the canoe rounded the bend of the river with Kenneth at the tiller, bareheaded in the rain. We left our friends at Wailamipu with regret, tempered by the pleasant anticipation of dry clothes that awaited us at the Camarang. When we arrived there, we found that Jack's week... So Jack is the London Zoo worker who's collecting the animals and looking after the animals they've caught. That Jack's week had, on the whole, been more profitable than ours, for he had assembled quite a large miscellaneous collection of animals. There were numerous parrots, several snakes and a young otter and several dozen hummingbirds feeding very happily from glass bottles, the lack of which had forced us to relieve our tufted coquette. We discussed plans for the week and that now remained before our plane was due to return to Imbimadai to collect us. It was decided that Jack should remain at Camarang and that Charles and I should set out again on another canoe journey with the object of visiting as many villages as possible. We asked Bill's advice. Why not travel up the Kukui, he suggested. That's fairly heavily populated and most of the villages are unmissionized, so you might hear some Alleluia chants. Take the smaller canoe, and when you return down the Kukai, carry on up the Mazurini to the Imbimadai. We will go up the big canoe, uh, we will go up in the big canoe with all the animals and meet you there. We set off the next day with the intention of spending our first night in the Kukui King, the village at the mouth of Kukui. King George and another American Indian named Abel came with us. The small canoe was heavily loaded with food, hammocks, a new supply of film, several empty cages ready for any animals we might find, and a large stock of blue and white glass beads with which to buy them. The colour of these beads was important, as Bill had told us when we bought them at his store. In the upper Camarang, the inhabitants were very fond of red and pink, as well as blue beads for the manufacture of their bead aprons and other personal ornaments. On the Kukri, they were more conservative and blue and white beads were the only acceptable currency, so quite literally they will use them as a form of money, trading beads wherever they need. We reached the Kukui King in the late afternoon. Like Wailamepu, it was a collection of simple wooden thatched huts in a clearing in the forest. The inhabitants stood morose and silent on the bank as we disembarked. As cheerfully as we could, we explained why we had come and asked if anyone had any pets, which they... I'm just going to show you the picture in a second, which they would be willing to exchange for beads. And here they are. So this is Abel. He was one of the men who's accompanied them up the river, and he's in the front of the canoe there. You can sort of see like the forest just in the background too. So is anyone going to exchange any pets that they've got? One or two bedraggled little birds in filthy wicker baskets were reluctantly produced, and the villagers continued to regard us very suspiciously. This was unexpected after the genial and cheerful people we had known at Wailamipu. These people not happy? I asked. The headman, he is ill, said King George replied. He lie in his hammock for many weeks now, and the pier man, the medicine man, he go to pier to cure him tonight, so they not happy here. How does he pee? I asked. Well, in the middle of the night, he called spirits down from the sky to come and make the head man better. Will you ask the pier man if he will speak with us? King George disappeared in the crowd and returned with a prosperous looking man in his early thirties. Unlike the rest of, oops, unlike the rest of the villagers, 
who were wearing either shabby European clothes or loincloths and blue bead aprons, the pier man was dressed comparatively neatly in khaki shorts and a shirt. He looked at us rather sulkily. I explained that we had come in the village to make pictures and recordings to take back to our country and asked if we might visit his seance that night. He grunted and nodded. Could we perhaps bring a small light to take photographs, I asked. He looked up and said severely, Any man who showed light when spirits in hut, he die. I passed over the subject quickly and picked up my tape recorder. As I did so, I plugged the microphone in and switched it on. May I bring this then, I asked. What kind of ting that, he said disparagingly. Listen, I replied, and wound back the tape. What kind of ting that, he repeated, or repeated the small loudspeaker rather tinnily. The suspicious look on the pier man's face dissolved into a grin. You find ting, he replied, addressing the machine. You agree that I bring it tonight so I can learn the spirit songs? I continued. Yes, I agree, said the pier man amicably, and turned on his heel and walked away. The crowd dispersed and King George led us through the village to the small empty hut on the edge of the clearing. We dumped our kit and slung our hammocks. As the sun set, I practised loading and unloading the tape recorder with my eyes tightly shut. It was not as easy as I had imagined and I was constantly getting lengths of tape entangled with the knob and levers of the machine. Eventually, I felt reasonably confident that I could change the reels in total darkness, but as a safeguard, I decided to go to the seance smoking a cigarette so that, initially at least, I should be able to solve any uh, solve any unforeseen difficulties by the light of its glow. So it's not allowed lights, but if you can use the light at the end of a cigarette, which is absolutely tiny, that might be a backup. Late that night, Charles and I picked our way in the darkness through the silent village. The pointed silhouettes of the huts jutted black against the cloudy, moonless sky. We entered the big uh, hut and to find it crammed with people. A small wood fire burned in the centre of the floor, illuminating the faces and bodies of the men and women who were squatting in it. In the semi-darkness beyond, we could just distinguish the dim, white underbellies of the occupied hammocks, one of which we knew contained the sick headman. King George was sitting on the wooden floor close to where we stood. Next to him we recognised the pier man squatting on his haunches and naked to the waist. In his hands he held two large sprigs of leaves and by him stood a small calabash full of what we later discovered to be to salted tobacco juice. We sat down close by him. I carried a lighted cigarette in my hand as I had planned but the pier man spotted it immediately. Is no good, he said aggressively, so I meekly stubbed it out on the floor. The pier man gave an instruction, Akaweo. The fire was kicked out by someone, hung a blanket over the door. The shadowy outlines of the people sitting around me disappeared into blackness. It was totally dark. I groped for the recorder in front of me and found the switch so that I should be ready to begin recording as soon as the seance began. I heard the pier man clear his throat and gargle with the tobacco juice. Then the leaves began to rustle. The eerie noise grew louder and louder like a drum roll until at its loudest it resolved itself into a hypnotic rhythmic beating which filled the hut. The pier man's voice rose, ab uh, rose above the noise of the leaves in a moaning chant. King George, just behind me, whispered in my ear, is calling the Karawai spirits to come. He shaped like rope and all other spirits climbed down him. After ten minutes the invocation came to an end. There was silence, broken only by the heavy breathing of someone close to me. It's all quite sort of spiritual and hypnotic and almost a bit scary, isn't it? Oh, so I've just dropped my bookmark. A rustle sounded high in the roof and slowly descended, increasing in volume until it ended abruptly with a thump on the floor. A pause, a gargle, and then a quacking noise. A strained falsetto voice began singing. Presumably this was the Karawari song. Well, this song continued for several minutes when suddenly the pitch darkness was stabbed by a spurt of flame from the dying embers of the fire. In its momentary light, I saw the pier man, still close to me, his eyes shut and his face contorted with beads of sweat lining his brow. The flame died almost immediately, but it had broken the tension and the chanting and rustling stopped abruptly. Two boys on my left chatted uneasily. The leaf rustlings began again. The friar frightened the Karawari, muttered King George in explanation. He no come again. Pier man now trying to get Casamara spirit. He look like man, and he bring rope ladder. The chant continued, and once again in the blackness we heard a rustle descend from the roof. Another gargle and a loud announcement in Akaweo, which was replied to in a fairly tart terms by a little girl somewhere on our right. 
What do they say? I asked King George in the darkness. Casamara say he work hard, he whispered, and that the headman must pay well, and the girl she say he only pay if you make him better. The leaves were now thrashing wildly and seemed to travel nearer the headman's hammock. Soon the voice of several villagers began to join in with the spirit song, and someone beat time with thumps on the floor, until the song ceased and the rustles rode and faded away in the roof. Another spirit arrived, more gargles, more songs. I felt almost suffocated by the stifling heat and the smell of sweating bodies in the pitch darkness of the hut. Every few minutes I had to change the tape on my recorder, but many of the spirit songs seemed repetitive, and I did not record them all. After about an hour and a half, our initial awe began to wear thin. Charles sitting by me whispered in my ear, I wonder... I wonder what would happen if you wound back the tape now and made the first spirit reappear. I was disinclined to experiment. The seance continued for yet another hour. Spirit after spirit descended from the roof, sang its song over the headman's hammock and departed. Most of them had song ventriloquist falsetto, but eventually a different spirit arrived, chanting in a retching, gulping manner that was quite frightening to listen to. I heard King George's voice whisper, This the bush died I, he very strong spirit of strangled man who came from topside in the mountains. The atmosphere became oppressively tense and charged with emotion. The peer man sitting a few feet away from me was now quite feverish, for in the darkness I could sense his position almost exactly from the heat of his body. The maniacal chant continued for several minutes and then abruptly stopped. There was a tense silence and I waited a little apprehensively in the darkness for what would happen next. The seance had obviously reached its climax. Was there perhaps going to be a sacrifice? Suddenly a hot, sweaty hand gripped my arm. I swung round, startled, but I could see nothing in the blackness. A man's hair brushed against my face. I was sure it was the pier man and flashed through my mind that the nearest white man were Bill and Jack forty miles away. The pier man spoke hoarsely in my ear. All is finished. I go and make water. Oh, and I'm going to end it there and we'll decide whether we'll find out next time whether the uh, the pier man has been successful in trying to cure the head man. Thanks for now for watching this video and I hope to see you all again soon. Bye bye for now.